Good morning, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the AbV fourth quarter 2020 earnings conference call. All participants will be able to listen only until the question and answer portion of this call. You may ask a question by pressing star one on your phone. I would now like to introduce Ms. Liz Shea, Vice President of Investor Relations. Good morning, and thanks for joining us. Also on the call with me today are Rick Gonzalez, Chairman of the Board and Chief Executive Officer, Michael Severino, Vice Chairman and President, and Rob Michael, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Joining us for the Q&A portion of the call is Jeff Stewart, Executive Vice President, Commercial Operations. Before we get started, I remind you that some statements we make today may be considered forward-looking statements for purposes of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Abby cautions that these forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, including the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Abby's operations and financial results that may cause actual results to differ materially from those indicated in the forward-looking statement. Additional information about these risks and uncertainties is included in our 2019 annual <coughs> report on Form 10-K and in our other SEC filings. Abby undertakes no obligation to update these forward-looking statements except as required by law. On today's conference call, as in the past, non-GAAP financial measures will be used to help investors understand Abby's ongoing business performance. These non-GAAP financial measures are reconciled with comparable GAAP financial measures in our earnings release and regulatory filings from today, which can be found on our website. Unless otherwise noted, our commentary on sales growth is on a comparable basis, which includes full year, full current year, and historical results for Allergan. For this comparison of underlying performance, all historically reported Allergan revenues have been recast to conform to Abby's revenue recognition accounting policies and exclude the divestitures of ZenPEP and BioCase. References to operational growth further excludes the impact of exchange. Following our prepared remarks, we'll take your questions. So with that, I'll now turn the call over to Rick. Thank you, Liz. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'll discuss our fourth quarter and full year 2020 performance, as well as our expectations for 2021. Mike will then provide an update on recent advancements across our pipeline, and Rob will discuss the quarter and our 2021 guidance in more detail. Following our remarks, we'll take your questions. We delivered another strong quarter with adjusted earnings per share of $2.92, exceeding the midpoint of our guidance by eight cents. Fourth quarter, total net revenues were up nearly 7% on a comparable operational basis. This performance was driven by robust double-digit sales growth from our immunology, hemonc, and neuroscience franchises, as well as 9% comparable operational sales growth of Botox Cosmetic, which is demonstrating a rapid recovery. Our fourth quarter performance tops off another excellent and truly transformational year for AbbVie, which included the successful acquisition and integration of Allergan, creating a stronger and much more diverse AbbVie, with leadership across numerous attractive high-growth markets, significant contributions from our two new best-in-category immunology medicines, Rinvoke and Skyrizi which combined for more than $2.3 billion in 2020 sales, their first full year on the market. We expect the combined contribution from Rinvoke and Skyrizi to nearly double in 2021 to approximately $4.6 billion based on their continued strong uptake in RA and psoriasis, as well as Rinvoke's anticipated approvals in PSA, ankylosing spondylitis, and atopic dermatitis later this year. We delivered continued robust growth from our leading Hemon portfolio, with Imbruvica and Benclexta contributing more than $6.6 .6 billion in combined 2020 sales. We expect our Hemon franchise to grow double digits again in 2021. We also added two compelling oncology pipeline assets, Epicritimab, a potential best-in-class CD3 by CD20 by specific antibody in development for B-cell malignancies, and lemzoparlamab, an anti-CD47 monoclonal antibody being studied in multiple cancers. These two assets will further support the growth of our Hemon franchise across our long-range plan. The acquisition of Allergan 
brought us a substantial neuroscience portfolio with compelling therapies for migraine and psychiatric conditions, augmenting our already existing neuro franchise. The newly combined neuroscience franchise delivered nearly $4.9 billion in comparable 2020 revenue and is expected to grow double digits in 2021. We also added the leading global aesthetics franchise, a largely cash pay portfolio with roughly $3.5 billion in comparable 2020 revenues. As I previously noted, this portfolio has demonstrated a rapid V-shaped recovery, and we view aesthetics as an extremely attractive long-term growth opportunity. And importantly, we've made excellent progress in 2020 with our pipeline. We expect our R&D pipeline advancements to lead to the approval of more than a dozen new products or indications over the next two years, including a total of six additional indications for Rinvoke and Skyrizi, which will cover all of Humira's major indications, plus new significant disease areas, including atopic dermatitis, expanded indications for Venclexta and Velar, and several new product approvals including a toe Japan for episodic migraine, Nevitoclax for myelofibrosis, and ABBV 951, a potentially transformative next-generation therapy for advanced Parkinson's disease. These new opportunities will collectively add meaningful revenue growth in advance of the U.S. Humira LOE. We've entered 2021 in a strong position which is reflected in our revenue and earnings per share guidance. Based on the recent outperformance of our business, we expect full year 2021 comparable operational sales growth of approximately 9.4%, with total ABBE sales expected to be approximately $1.7 billion above current consensus. And we anticipate 2021 adjusted earnings per share of $12.32 to $12.52, representing growth of 17.6% at the midpoint. This level of guidance represents impressive performance with nearly all aspects of our business expected to perform at or above current consensus for 2021. The Allergan integration continues to go very well. The transition has been seamless despite the size of the transaction and the timing of the COVID pandemic. While we're making excellent progress against our expense synergies, which Rob will cover in more detail here momentarily, it remains increasingly clear to us that there are significant opportunities for long-term revenue contributions across numerous Allergan growth platforms. As we recently disclosed, we believe you Brelby the first to market and leading oil CGRP for acute migraine represents a $1 billion plus peak sales opportunity. A Japan, a potential once daily oral treatment for the prevention of episodic and chronic migraine also represents a $1 billion plus peak sales opportunity. We expect Baylor's peak sales to approach $4 billion within its currently approved indications of schizophrenia bipolar one disorder, and bipolar depression, with major depressive disorder, or MDD, representing a potentially significant incremental growth opportunity. Anesthetics, which is poised to regain its growth trajectory this year, is expected to generate high single-digit revenue growth over the next decade. We continue to closely monitor the COVID dynamics which will have an impact on our business again in 2021, predominantly in the first half of the year, but significantly moderated from the 2020 impact. And despite the recent COVID resurgence within select geographies, we feel the global healthcare system is much better equipped with COVID treatment protocols and PPE to safely see and treat patients throughout the current year. That said, some therapeutic areas continue to be more impacted than others, like CLL, HCV, certain hospital-based procedures, among others, which we have contemplated in our 2021 guidance. 
Overall, we've been pleased with the rate of recovery across our business, a testament to our differentiated product profiles and our commercial execution. So in summary, we've assembled an impressive set of growth assets, and the outlook for Abby's business remains strong. With Rinvoke and SkyRizzy expected to contribute more than $15 billion in risk-adjusted sales by 2025, and our expectations for continued robust growth across Piedmont, neuroscience, and aesthetics, we have a high degree of confidence that we will be able to successfully, uh, successfully absorb the Humira LOE impact in 2023, support an immediate return to total sales growth in 2024, and produce compelling high single-digit compounded annual total sales growth in 2025 through the remainder of the decade with the diversified portfolio and pipeline that we have today. With that, I'll turn the call over to Mike for additional comments on our R&D programs. Mike? Thank you, Rick. We've clearly made significant progress with our pipeline over the past few years, particularly our late-stage programs in hematologic oncology with Imbruvica and Venclexta, and in immunology with Rinvok and Skyrizi. Since inception, our R&D organization has delivered an impressive set of new products, which collectively contributed approximately $11 billion in revenue in 2020. We also continue to see significant evolution of our early and mid-stage clinical programs, with many assets expected to transition to late-stage registrational studies over the next several years. We will continue to replenish our late-stage pipeline with innovative assets that have the potential to drive additional growth for AbbVie in the second half of the decade. At our recent Immunology Investor event in December, we provided a detailed overview of our immunology programs, highlighting the robust data generated to date for Rinvoke and SkyRizzi across approved and pipeline indications. Included in this event, we presented positive top-line data from two new Phase three studies for Rinvoke, results from the first induction study in ulcerative colitis and results from the head-to-head -head study versus dupilumab in atopic dermatitis. We expect to see results from the second Phase three UC induction study later this quarter and from the UC maintenance study in the middle of this year, with regulatory submissions anticipated in the second half of 2021. Our regulatory applications for Rinvoke and atopic dermatitis are currently under review, and we expect an approval decision in the U.S. in the second quarter based on priority review, and in Europe in the second half of the year. We recently received European Commission approval for Rinvoke in psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis, and expect approval decisions for those indications in the U.S. in the first half of this year. I want to take a moment to address the topic of safety, specifically MACE and malignancies, following the results from Topositinib's post-marketing safety study. At present, there are no data to suggest the safety outcomes from their study apply to a specific JAK1 inhibitor, such as Rinvoke. We are not aware of any signal for an elevated risk of MACE or malignancies with the Rinvoke or any JAK inhibitor other than Zelljans. We conducted a pooled database analysis across our clinical trials for DBT, MACE, and malignancies at the time of Rinvoke's regulatory submission, and have updated it periodically, including up to the present. Rates with Rinvoke have not been elevated relative to comparators or to expected baseline rates. Importantly, there has been no increase or meaningful change in those rates over time. Additionally, we adjudicate events for MACE and DBT, which is, which is considered the highest standard of evidence. If we look across our long-term database in RA, a population that is at increased risk for MACE events, our rates remain low. At the approved dose in RA, we have followed more than 3,700 treated patients, totaling more than 9,000 patient years experience. Our rate of MACE events is 0.4 for 100 patient years, which compares favorably to the expected rate of 1.0 to 1.7 events per 100 patient years. 
In addition, there is no evidence of a dose response between the 15 and 30 milligram doses. Similarly, the rate of malignancy, excluding non-melanoma skin cancer, with similar follow-up, is 0.8 events per 100 patient years. This rate is also consistent with the expected range of rates of 0.86 to 0.94 per 100 patient years. And again, we see no evidence of a dose response between 15 and 30 milligrams. Moving now to SkyRISI. We also recently reported top-line results from the Phase three programs for SkyRISI in Crohn's disease and psoriatic arthritis. In the two Crohn's induction studies, SkyRISI demonstrated significant improvements in clinical remission and endoscopic endpoints compared to placebo, with symptom improvement seen as early as week four. Based on the data generated to date, we believe SkyRISI has the potential to become an important new treatment option for patients with moderate to severe Crohn's disease. We expect to see results from the maintenance study in Crohn's disease later this year, with regulatory submissions anticipated in the second half of 2021. We're also very pleased with SkyRISI's results in the phase three studies in psoriatic arthritis where we saw significant improvements in disease activity across both skin and joint endpoints compared to placebo. We believe that the activity we have seen on joint disease and the impressive skin clearance that is a hallmark of the SkyRISI program make it a compelling offering for patients with mixed joint and skin involvement. We plan to submit our regulatory applications for, for SkyRISI in psoriatic arthritis in the first half of this year. We're making good progress with our early and mid-stage immunology programs as well, where we expect several data readouts and phase transitions in 2021. We expect to begin three new studies for ABBV154, our TNF steroid conjugate, including a phase 2B dose ranging study in RA, as well as phase two studies in Crohn's disease and polymyalgia rheumatica and we'll see proof of concept data in the second quarter for rabagalumab, our CD40 antagonist in phase two for ulcerative colitis, and for ABBV157, our oral ROR gamma T inhibitor in phase one for psoriasis. Both of these programs experienced slight COVID-related delays with results now expected for both in the second quarter of this year. In oncology, we continue to make significant progress advancing our pipeline with numerous data readouts and regulatory milestones last year, as well as the addition of several new assets brought in through our in-licensing efforts, including GenMab's CD3 by CD20 Epcaritimab and IMAB's anti-CD47 Lemzoparlamab. We showcased new data from several programs at the recent ASH meeting, where we presented nearly 40 abstracts from eight different assets. Notable presentations included data from the phase two Captivate trial, evaluating Imbruvica plus Venclexta in frontline CLL, which showed patients who achieved undetectable MRD following this combination maintain their deep remission at the one year mark after stopping therapy with a 95% rate of disease-free survival. We also presented new five-year data from Venclexta's Murano trial, demonstrating the benefits of fixed duration Venclexta combinations in helping patients achieve sustained progression-free survival. The latest results from Murano in the relapse refractory CLL setting showed a median progression-free survival of 54 months in the Venclexta and Rituximab group compared to 17 months in the Vendamustine Rituximab group three or more years after stopping treatment. Updated dose escalation data from a phase one study evaluating epcaritimab in B-cell malignancies were also presented at ASH. Epcaritimab is a subcutaneously delivered bispecific CD3 by CD20 antibody being developed in collaboration with GenMab. In the phase one study, epcaritimab demonstrated encouraging single-agent anti-tumor activity in heavily pretreated patients with a consistent and favorable safety profile showing no grade three or higher CRS events 
as well as limited neurotoxicity. We believe that pyritimab has the potential to become a best-in-class therapy across a number of B-cell malignancies, including diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. The Phase three trial in relapse refractory, DLBCL, recently began, and we will provide updates on epcaritimab as its development program progresses. Initial results were also presented from a Phase one study evaluating TNB383B in relapse refractory multiple myeloma. TNB383B is a novel, bispecific T-cell engaging immunotherapy targeting BCMA and CD3 being developed in collaboration with Teneo Bio. These phase one results demonstrated that the BCMA CD3 bispecific provided overall response rates of 80%, with a large number of patients achieving a very good partial response or better, despite having received multiple prior lines of therapy. TNB383B was well tolerated at all doses tested, with few off-target toxicities and no grade three or higher CRS observed. With its safety profile, efficacy, and the convenience of once every three week dosing, this agent has the potential to become a promising treatment option for myeloma patients. And our partner IMAB published an abstract with initial results from a phase one study evaluating lemzoparlamab in AML and MDS. These results demonstrated encouraging activity in relapsed refractory AML patients. And lemzoparlamab was well tolerated with no serious hematological adverse events reported to date. Based on these promising initial results, we plan to begin new studies this year for lemzoparlamab in AML, MDS, and in multiple myeloma. We also recently saw data from an interim analysis of a phase two study evaluating TELISO-V in heavily pretreated, non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer patients. The encouraging results from stage one of this study met the criteria for advancing the program, with TELISO-V demonstrating a 54% objective response rate in patients with wild type EGFR who have highly expressed CMET in EGFR wild-type patients with overexpressed CMAT, which includes both high and intermediate expression, the objective response rate was 35%. Based on these results, we believe that there is an important role for TELISO-V in this target population, which represents roughly 25% of the non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer population. We will be opening the second stage of the study and are planning discussions with regulators regarding the potential of this study to support an accelerated filing. We expect 2021 to be another important year for our oncology pipeline, with several regulatory submissions, as well as data readouts across all stages of development. This year, we expect to see data for Imbruvica in the Phase three SHINE study in frontline MCL, with regulatory submissions expected in the second half of the year. Data for Imbruvica in combination with Venclexta in second line or greater MCL and frontline CLL with regulatory submission for frontline CLL expected in the second half of the year. We also expect to see data from registration enabling studies for Venclexta in high risk MDS and Nivitoclax in relapse refractory myelofibrosis. And we expect to see data from numerous programs in our early stage oncology pipeline. In addition, the programs under collaboration with Calico are also progressing well. Our partnered effort is comprised of a strong pipeline of novel targets, which includes more than 20 active programs in discovery or preclinical development. Importantly, we currently have programs which have advanced into clinical development in two areas immuno-oncology, and neurodegeneration. The lead Calico program in oncology is focused on PTPN2 inhibitors, which act at multiple steps in the cancer immunity cycle and have potential applicability in a broad variety of tumor types. The discovery of novel, orally bioavailable PTPN2 inhibitors represents a significant breakthrough in a target class 
that has historically been considered undruggable. We currently have two assets in Phase I development, ABBV, CLS, 579, and 484. We've seen evidence of immune activation in the clinic with this pathway, and we expect to see proof of concept data from this program in 2022. The lead calico program in neuroscience is an EIF-2B activator, which targets a key regulator of the highly conserved integrated stress response pathway. Inhibition of this pathway has the potential to prevent pathology and restore function in a number of neurodegenerative diseases, such as ALS and Parkinson's disease, as well as in traumatic brain injury. Our lead EIF-2B activator, ABBV CLS 7262, is currently progressing through phase one, and we plan to begin a study later this year in patients with ALS. In other neuroscience updates, last year we completed our registrational program for Atojapan in episodic migraine prevention, and we recently submitted our regulatory application to the FDA. We expect an approval decision by the end of the third quarter. The data generated in our phase three program support a strong benefit risk profile, and we believe that Atojapan has the potential to offer meaningful benefits to patients as a safe, effective oral treatment option for the prevention of episodic migraine. In 2021, we expect to see data from several late-stage neuroscience assets, including results from two phase three studies for Vralar in major depressive disorder, and results from the pivotal program for ABBV 951 in advanced Parkinson's disease, with regulatory submissions for 951 expected in the second half of the year. We also expect to see proof of concept data for elizanumab in a phase two study in multiple sclerosis and ABBV AE12, our lead anti-tau antibody in a phase two study in Alzheimer's disease. In addition to AD12, we have a number of promising approaches in Alzheimer's, including our neuroinflammation programs aimed at TREM2 and CD33, currently in clinical development, as well as other tau approaches in preclinical development. These include tau antibodies with different epitope specificity, as well as approaches to clear intracellular tau. In aesthetics, we continue to make excellent progress with our portfolio of facial toxins and dermal fillers. With several regulatory submissions, data readouts, and pivotal study starts expected this year. Our programs include new indications for Botox, as well as innovative toxins, such as new liquid formulations and both long and short acting toxins. We also have programs to develop new indications for the Juvederm collection, as well as novel dermal fillers, such as Harmonica, which will be entering registration enabling studies in the US. And in eye care, based on the positive results from the phase three studies evaluating our topical eye drop, HDN190, 584 for the treatment of symptoms associated with presbyopia. We plan to submit our regulatory application later this month and expect an approval decision in the fourth quarter of this year. So in summary, our R&D productivity remained high last year despite multiple COVID-related challenges, and we were able to maintain study continuity and minimize delays. We're entering 2021 well positioned for continued success and we expect significant program advancement across all stages of our pipeline again this year. This includes five new asset or major indication approvals, half a dozen regulatory submissions, more than 10 pivotal study readouts, and more than 15 data readouts from early and mid-stage programs. With that, I'll turn the call over to Rob for additional comments on our fourth quarter performance and our 2021 guidance. Rob? Thank you, Mike. Starting with fourth quarter results, we once again delivered strong top and bottom line performance. We reported adjusted earnings per share of $2.92, above our guidance midpoint by $0.08. Cents. Total net revenues were approximately $13.9 billion, up 6.8% on a comparable operational basis and ahead of our expectations. Immunology global sales were approximately $6 billion, 
up 14.8% on an operational basis. Within immunology, Humira sales were approximately $5.2 billion, up 4.4% on an operational basis, with continued high single-digit growth in the U.S., offset by biosimilar competition across international markets. Skyrizzi sales were $525 million, and Rimvoke sales were $281 million, with both products demonstrating strong sequential growth above expectations. Hematologic Oncology delivered another strong quarter, with revenue of approximately $1.8 billion, up 15.5% on an operational basis, with solid growth from Imbruvica and Benclexta. Aesthetic sales were more than $1.1 billion, with Botox Cosmetic and Juvederm both experiencing a rapid recovery from the COVID pandemic. Neuroscience revenues were nearly $1.4 billion, up 14.9% on a comparable operational basis, led by Vralar and our migraine portfolio. We also saw a significant contribution from eye care, which had sales of more than $900 million. Turning now to the P&L profile for the fourth quarter, adjusted gross margin was 81.8% of sales, adjusted R&D investment was 12.6% of sales, and adjusted SG&A expense was 22.3% of sales. The adjusted operating margin ratio was 46.9% of sales, an improvement of 230 basis points versus the prior year. Net interest expense was $618 million, and the adjusted tax rate was 11.6%. As we look ahead to 2021, our full-year adjusted earnings per share guidance is between $12.32 and $12.52, reflecting growth of 17.6% at the midpoint. Excluded from this guidance is $5.63 of known intangible amortization and specified items. We expect adjusted net revenue of approximately $55.7 billion. At current rates, we expect foreign exchange to have a 1% favorable impact on full year comparable sales growth. This forecast comprehends the following assumptions for our key products and therapeutic areas. We expect immunology global sales of approximately $25 billion, including U.S. Humira growth of approximately 8%, international Humira revenue of approximately $3 billion at current exchange rates, Guy Rizzi global sales of approximately $2.9 billion, and Rinvo global sales of approximately $1.7 billion. We expect hematologic oncology to grow double digits, with Imbruvica global revenue of approximately $5.7 billion, and Venclex to global sales of approximately $1.8 billion. For aesthetics, we expect global sales of approximately $4.5 billion, including approximately $1.8 billion from Botox Cosmetic and approximately $1.3 billion from Juvederm. For neuroscience, we expect global revenue of approximately $5.7 billion, including Botox Therapeutic sales of approximately $2.3 billion, Vralar sales of approximately $1.8 billion, and your Belvi sales of approximately $400 million. For eye care, we expect global sales of approximately $2.9 billion, including approximately $550 million from Restasis, which assumes no generic competition in the first half of 2021. For women's health, we expect global revenue of approximately $1.1 billion. For our remaining larger products, we expect global sales of approximately $2 billion from Maverette, $1.2 billion from Creon, $1 billion from Linzess, $800 million from Synthroid, and $750 million from Lupron. Looking at the P&L for 2021, we are forecasting full-year adjusted gross margin of approximately 83% of sales, adjusted R&D investment of approximately $6.6 billion, and adjusted sg expense of approximately $11.8 billion. This guidance includes approximately $1.7 billion in expense synergies from the Allergan acquisition. We are forecasting an adjusted operating margin ratio of approximately 50% of sales, which represents an improvement of roughly 200 basis points versus 2020. We expect adjusted net interest expense of approximately $2.4 billion, our non-GAAP tax rate to be approximately 12.5%, and our share count to be roughly flat to Q4 2020. 
as we look ahead to the first quarter, we anticipate net revenue approaching $12.7 billion. At current rates, we expect foreign exchange to have a 1% favorable impact on comparable sales growth. We are forecasting an adjusted operating margin ratio of approximately 50% of sales, and we model a non-GAAP tax rate of 12.3%. We expect adjusted earnings per share between $2.79 and $2.83, excluding approximately $1.32 of known intangible amortization and specified items. Finally, Avi's strong business performance and outlook continues to support our capital allocation priorities. Our cash balance at the end of December was $8.4 billion, and we expect to generate free cash flow of approximately $21 billion in 2021. This fully supports a strong and growing dividend, which we have more than tripled since inception, as well as rapid debt repayment, where we expect to pay down $17 billion of combined company debt by the end of 2021 including the $8.6 billion that was repaid in 2020. We expect to achieve a net debt to EBITDA ratio just below 2.5 times by the end of 2021, with further deleveraging through 2023. We anticipate that our net leverage ratio will be approximately two times by the end of 2022. Our strong cash flow also allows for continued business development, with approximately $2 billion allocated annually to augment our pipeline with the most promising external technologies and innovative mid to late stage assets. In closing, we are very pleased with Avi's strong performance in 2020. We've driven top tier growth while also advancing our strategic priorities. And we expect to deliver robust performance in 2021 and over the long term. With that, I'll turn the call back over to Liz. Thanks, Rob. We will now open the call for questions. In the interest of hearing from as many analysts as possible over the remainder of the call, we ask that you please limit your questions to one or two. Operator, first question, please. And as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one. And our first question today is from Jeffrey Porges from SVB Larynx. Thank you very much, and and as usual, appreciate all the the detail and the guidance, and, and congratulations on the results. Uh, a quick question on SkyReasy and one on Rinvoc. First, um, one of your competitors had a negative result of a, of a um, post-marketing study recently. I'm just wondering if you've had any discussions with regulators about uh, conducting any other studies for Rinvoc or updating the label for Rinvoc as a result of, of that negative signal. And then secondly on SkyReasy, a commercial question. Um, your current price for the 150 milligram dose is about $85,000. and you're using 4X the dose for ulcerative colitis. Could you just tell us um, how you can manage that and, and is it feasible to have um, sort of different prices uh, despite the big difference in dosing? Thanks. Okay, this is Mike. Um, I will take your second question first uh, and then uh, we can uh, cover the SkyRizzy question. Uh, with respect to Rinvoc, I assume you're talking about the uh, tofacitinib safety study, uh, which sure. top line results uh, fairly recently in the last several days um, and showed in that program that they were unable to exclude uh, a risk of MACE or malignancy based on the criteria uh, that were used to, to analyze that data set. Um, as I said in, in my prepared remarks, we've kept a very, very close eye on our data, um, both at the time of the NDA and and uh, in an ongoing manner since that time, um, and we've not seen a signal. Um, our rates have not been elevated uh, with respect to comparator uh, or baseline rates, and the rates overall remain low. Uh, with respect to your specific question about what, whether we've had discussions with regulators, uh, regulators have not asked us to do a long-term safety study um, in, in the way that Pfizer was asked, uh, so that has not been discussed with regulators, um, and we have not had any contact with regulators uh, around labeling updates, um, you know, up to the present time. Right. Um, and with respect to Sky Rizzi? Yeah, hi, it's Jeff, it's Jeff Stewart. On the commercial question, you know, we, we have anticipated the, uh, you know, the different markets and how we, uh, we will appro- approach the pricing. Now, it's important that we're just starting to see the Sky Rizzi data. We saw the induction data. We'll see the maintenance data. 
I think it's important that as we look at our, our strategy that we're, we're honing is for Skyrizi, you're going to, for Crohn's, you're going to have an induction dose, which is a, which is an IV at a different dose. And we know that based on the form and some things we can uh, believe we can price that to market. And also we're coming with a, uh, a unique approach for the maintenance as well, depending on where that dosing uh, falls out. And uh, we would be using at that point, which is known a, a on-body injector. So the combination of, of the forms as well as basically the ways that we will deliver uh, the medication when we get there, we believe that we can, we can price effectively to the market and manage it across the uh, indications. So this is Rick. So I think the bottom line is we've contemplated that. It's a good question, Jeff. Uh, but I think we have a strategy that will allow us to deal with that and, uh, and impact the market in an appropriate way. Thanks, Jeff. Operator, next question, please. And our next question is from Vamo Devan from Mizuho Securities. Hi, great. Thanks uh, so much for taking the questions. Maybe two if I could. So one, appreciate the long-term guidance you've given recently on the top line. I'm just wondering um, how we should maybe think about the margin progression as we think about the Himera LOE in a couple of years, and then as we sort of get past that and your sales starts to ramp up again, if you can maybe give some sense of where you think your margins could sort of come back to. And then the other one I have is just on Braylar. Uh, again, appreciate the, the guidance you've given there. Uh, I think one of the big events for you guys this year will be the phase three data in MDD. I'm just curious kind of what gives you confidence and maybe you can just talk about whether it's around the, the drug or the study design, sort of what gives you uh, confidence uh, or why should we be confident sort of going into that data readout. Thanks. This is Rob. I'll take your question on margin progression. I think when you consider the greater than $2 billion expense synergies from Allergan by next year and the P&L leverage that will come from the sales growth that we also expect for next year, you should expect that our operating margin will continue to expand through 22. Upon the entry of U.S. biosimilars in 23 and given Humera's profitability, it is, you know, it is reasonable to expect operating margin to pull back. We've indicated before to the 45% uh, range. Based on our current LRP, I think it will be a little bit higher than that. Um, but then when we return to growth immediately, in, in, in 24, we'll return to revenue growth, but very strong revenue growth starting in 25. You can expect then, you know, operating margins once again expand. We've had a long history of expanding operating margin uh, by leveraging the P&L, and I would expect that to continue as we start to see very strong uh, revenue growth starting in 25 and beyond. Yeah, Vamo, this is Rick. I, uh, Mike and I will cover the second question on Baylor. Uh, it's important to recognize that what we've communicated in long-term guidance on Baylor is based on the three currently approved uh, indications. So it doesn't count on the fact that MDD would be successful. Now, having said that, I, I think we do have, uh, you know, I'd say we're cautiously optimistic about, uh, about the, uh, the MDD indication. And I'll let Mark kind of walk through how we look at it and what gives us that level of confidence. But in the event it weren't to play out, that doesn't impact the guidance that we gave. So this is Mike. I'll, I'll pick up from here. I think that our, our optimism, and I think that's the, the right way to express it in a disease like MDD, which is a challenging disease to work in, is based on a couple of features. One is based on the basic pharmacology of Braylar, um, which has a unique uh, mix of, of D3, D2 specificity and other features uh, that lead clinically to what's been described as a brightening effect, um, which seems to be beneficial in a number of settings. Um, it's also driven by the results that we have from the MDD study that is positive, um, that we already have in hand. So with one positive study, we would need only one, uh, at least one, uh, or of course both of the next two studies, uh, you know, to read out positive. Either of those outcomes uh, would support a filing. Um, we've done a deep dive into the study design and the patient population. We think it's a well-designed study, um, and we think the patient characteristics uh, uh, with respect to you know, baseline factors and, 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 and other uh, elements are all very appropriate for this sort of study, and we can assess that uh, in a blinded aggregate way um, in a way that's completely uh, consistent with uh, study roles for the conduct of the study. And so all of those things uh, make us feel optimistic that it's a molecule with a good chance to work, well-designed study, well-conducted study, and we look forward to seeing the results. But, you know, as I mentioned, MDD is a challenging area. And for that reason, 
uh, we didn't build it into our deal model, and we didn't factor it into our guidance, um, as Rick said. So we view this as upside. Thanks, Amal. Operator, Thanks. next question, please. Thank you. And our next question is from Randall Stanicky from RBC Capital Markets. Great. Back to Rinvoke and Atopic Therm. How quickly do you guys expect that launch to ramp? And maybe just help us with expectations given coinciding jack competition from Avril Sitna, the, the timing to payer ramp and coverage. And then, you know, what we sense is a lot of uh, patient warehousing. Maybe if you could help quantify your thinking around that opportunity within the $1.7 billion uh, outlook for the year, that would be helpful. And then a quick follow up, Rick. You don't get asked about eye care a lot. Uh, it's a $3 billion global franchise. You have some pipeline behind it. it. It could be a good growth business, but it's declining. Any appetite to strategically add to that business or reposition it, or should we view it more as a mature cash flow generator? Thanks. Yeah, hi, it's Jeff uh, Stewart. I'll start off with the Atopic Derm commercial question. You know, we're, we're very encouraged with the uh, market that we're about to enter. And I'll give you some context there. So, when we look at the uh, population, we see that just on the moderate to severe uh, atopic derm patients that the market size or the potential is at least two and probably closer to three times the size of the psoriasis market. And so this is uh, very, very encouraging in terms of our ability to enter. Um, it's also significantly underpenetrated. I mean, if you look at the psoriasis market, you're talking about far greater than, you know, 10 or 12 percent penetration and in the single digits, the low single digits where we are right now with the one biologic dupilumab. So it's a very, very attractive. The other thing that I would say is that we see uh, from, the, from our, our go-to-market approach that we know the HCPs very intimately. So about 85 percent of the market is driven by the derms. We know the derms very well, and there's a 90 percent, roughly 90 percent overlap with the big prescribers of dupilumab and drugs like Skyrizi and our Humira. So we, we are very, very encouraged at the ability for this uh, segment to rapidly expand, despite the fact there'll be multiple new entrants coming in. To get to your specific question about the uh, access ramp, you know, we have a very strong position, as you know, with Rinvoke right now in the existing indication of RA. We have greater than 95% commercial access. That's the dominant channel for atopic derm. And our anticipation is we will have very strong access that will build to that level over the course of 21. Um, obviously, it's going to take some time once we get the approval to go through the, the final approvals on the big commercial plans. And so we see it starting off slow, but then building into the middle of the year and certainly getting to a significant level at the end of the year. So the combination of the market, uh, the asset itself, which looks very, very strong, as you've seen from the data, and the way that we will play in our, our derm segment, as well as the allergy segment, uh, give us a lot of confidence for a strong ramp in 21 and beyond. Uh, the, uh, the only thing I would add to Jeff's comments, I mean, if you look at Rinvoke, uh, it did $731 million last year. Uh, obviously, if you look at the running rate, so, you know, out of the fourth quarter, it has a strong running rate coming out of the fourth quarter. But that's a billion dollars worth of growth uh, from 20 to 21. The majority of that growth is going to come from continued, you know, uh, performance in RA. Uh, I think where you will see the, the most significant impact from atopic dermatitis will be as we flow into 22, uh, much like as you saw what happened in the RA market. It takes time for physicians to start to adapt it. Once they do, their momentum picks up. So uh, I don't remember the specific number, and I'm not sure we gave that guidance anyway. Uh, but I, I would be thinking about it more that it's continued penetration and growth in RA that's driving the bulk of that growth. Rob, anything you want to add? Yeah, I just uh, on your question regarding warehouse patients, we have a very modest amount of, of uh, warehouse patients assumed in the forecast, so we're not counting the 1.7 billion doesn't really count on that. And keep in mind that Rinvoke was one of the products that was le lesser impacted. Uh, by, by COVID, and so there's not uh, really significant uh, warehousing in that forecast. And then, Randall, on your second question, I, I would say we absolutely agree with your point of view. I think eye care is a very attractive market. You know, the kinds of markets that I think we look for and that we're uh, the very best at is where there are specialized physicians who really uh, drive the use of medications based on the clinical data. 
and being able to restate markets uh, and improve standard of care in those markets. And certainly eye care, I think, uh, fits that description. Uh, so we would have a strong appetite to look for opportunities, and we are looking for opportunities now that we could add to that eye care business to be able to drive growth. Obviously, we're stasis, as, uh, as um, Rob indicated in his formal remarks. We built in a half a year. That's still an unknown of when that product will go generic or if it will go generic. But I think even aside from that, regardless of what happens with the stasis, longer term, this is an area that we would have interest. And if we could find the right kind of assets uh, to add to it, we would, we would enthusiastically do that. Thanks, Randall. Thanks, Operator, next question, please. And our next question is from Chris Schott from J.P. Morgan. Uh, great. Thanks so much for the questions. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on aesthetics and maybe just some of the learnings you've had in that franchise since you acquired it? Have there been changes in the way you think about approaching the business commercially or levels of investment? I'm just trying to get my hands around um, that high single-digit growth over time. Uh, it does seem healthier than the street had been anticipating. I'm just trying to get a little bit more uh, color of, of, of what you're seeing in the market that, that gives you confidence in that. Uh, and then my second question was just on Imbruvica. Uh, the growth has slowed here a bit. Can you just elaborate a bit more on how much of this is, is there any COVID-related dynamics playing out here? How much of this is competitive? And I'm just going to sense of, you know, just how, how you're seeing the, the, the health of that franchise over time. Thanks so much. Okay. Yeah, Chris, this is Rick. So I'll cover the aesthetics question for you. You know, I'd say as we've studied the aesthetics market and had an opportunity to be able to, uh, you know, operate the business now for some time, I think we're we're even more enthusiastic about the long-term ability to be able to grow this this market. I would say some of the areas that were a bit of a surprise to us is the responsiveness of this market to uh, patient activation. Um, and uh, I would say that the strategy that we've put in place is one where we are funding the business on a uh, on a very uh, on a continuous basis. At a, at, a, at a high level to achieve the level of activation that we're looking for. And we think that will, you know, certainly you can see the response, like as an example in Botox, uh, already we're seeing a very aggressive response uh, and being able to grow the market. You know, uh, you saw the Botox group, the Botox Cosmetic grew in the fourth quarter 9%. I would expect that we can continue to drive that level of growth. And uh, as part of, you know, legacy Allergan, I think it, uh, it was much more episodic in the way this was funded quarter to quarter, where we have we basically built a funding plan that will allow them to continue to drive activation over a long period of time. I'd say the second thing that's, that's of interest to us is I think this is a market where you can drive significant innovation if you fund that innovation in a way, again, on a, a more continuous basis. Uh, and advance those programs more aggressively and have a well-thought-out strategic roadmap as to where you're trying to drive some of these markets. As Mike mentioned in his, his comments, you know, our goal is to basically try to advance uh, the level of performance of the toxin market significantly over time, uh, and the same with the filler market. You know, there are certainly uh, things that we can do to expand the areas that you can use uh, fillers, uh, both within the U.S. and, and globally, and uh, that's a significant opportunity. But long term, we think there's an opportunity to take some of the biologic expertise that we are, have here at Abbey and create more uh, biologically active uh, fillers that not only do physical filling, but also improve collagen, improve elastin, and other kinds of characteristics that would improve skin quality. And we think that will be, if we're successful, we think that will be a significant opportunity to drive long-term growth. And then the last thing I'd say is the geographic footprint that Abbey has. We obviously have a very broad geographic footprint, and the structure that we've set up is this, you know, totally uh, integrated global unit that we're operating the aesthetics business really gives them the freedom to go out and expand uh, or more aggressively fund uh, areas around the globe that they think there is a significant opportunity. A good case in point is, uh, I believe it was in the fourth quarter, we funded a significant expansion in China uh, to be able to increase the sales force there, to be able to drive it 
uh, more deeply into uh, a broader set of the cities in China to the next level down. And we're already seeing the benefits of that. China is already back to growing much like it did pre-COVID. So I think there's a lot of attractive, attractive attributes about that. Uh, on Imbruvica, maybe Jeff and I will tag team on that one. What we're clearly seeing is that COVID is having an impact on uh, patient starts in CLL. We're not only seeing it in Imbruvica, but we're seeing it in, in Venclexta as well. And it's somewhat logical when you think about it. These oncology practices are trying to reduce density, um, and CLL is a disease where you can, in, in many patients' cases, you can delay therapy for some period of time. I would say that's the vast majority of it. Uh, when we look at when I look at the overall share, and the reason why I'm talking about the overall share is Benclexta is now gaining a significant level of momentum in this uh, in this market as well. When I look at our overall shares uh, in first line, second line, or third line, uh, we continue to have the dominant share position. And, uh, and I'd say probably partially to your question, if I look at CalQuents, um, I'd say it's performing you know, at the expectation we have. Uh, I think the first line share is about 12%, slightly higher in second line, maybe 14%. And I don't recall the third line share. Very similar. Yeah. So I'd say that's within the range of what we saw with MCL. It's within the range of what we had modeled. Uh, so it's not really a competitive uh, issue that we're dealing with. It's more a function of getting those patient starts back up to the level they were before. Anything you want to add, Jeff? No, I think, Rick, that's, that's exactly right. The only thing I would say in terms of our, our forecast, we think that in the first part of the year, the early part of the year, we'll continue to see some suppression in the new patient starts, but as we, as, we hit the, uh, as we hit the second and third quarter, we anticipate that the market will recover. Thanks, okay. Thanks Chris. Operator, next question, please. And our next question is from Tim Anderson from Wolf Research. Hi. Um, can you hear me? This is Nicole Mahar on for Tim Anderson. Uh, what does your long-term guidance assume for p potential austerity measures in the ex-U.S. countries in 2021 and beyond, similar to what we saw in the post-2008 time period, except uh, this time around it would be the fallout from the COVID impact? Yeah, Nicole, this is Rick. Um, you know, I think this is something we've had experience with. You know, if you think about, uh, you know, the economic crisis, I thought we saw a similar kind of uptick in uh, price erosion outside the United States, and in particular, I'd say, in, in the European uh, Union. Uh, we have factored in a reasonable assumption into our, into our guidance for 2021, so I, I feel good about that. Uh, I think it is reflective of what, we, what we're likely to see. Uh, so I think we're, we're covered from that perspective. Anything you want to add, Rob? No, okay. that covers it. Thanks, Nicole. Operator, next question, please. And our next question is from Steve Scala from Cohen. Uh, thank you. Uh, two questions. Evie delivered one of the first completely clean and compelling quarters in pharma this cycle, and I have to believe has something in reserve for upside as the year unfolds. I'm sure you monitor the competition. So beyond the AVI management team itself, what about your business do you think is allowing you to execute in this way? Would you attribute it to mainly to the products themselves, the payer strategies, geographic mix, or is there something else? And the second question is the ongoing Vralar phase three trials utilize doses up to three milligrams, while the successful prior trials were up to 4.5 milligrams. So why were the doses lowered in the first place, and um, what placebo response mitigation methods are included in the ongoing trials? Thank you. Okay, Steve, this is Rick. I'll cover the first one, and, and Mike can cover the second one. Um, you know, I would say, first and foremost, we are a very disciplined organization in how we approach execution in the marketplace. We tend to probably, even to some extent, obsessively plan and then go out and try to execute against that plan. And I think in times of difficulties, uh, that kind of discipline 
tends to demonstrate itself, uh, and and that's when you see that's when you see the biggest differences. So that's not to say other people don't do it like that. I, I'm not that familiar with how others operate, but I'm, I, I know how we operate, and I know how we contingency plan, uh, and we look at, okay, if that doesn't work, what are we going to do? And we do that ahead of time. And if that doesn't work, what are we going to do? And I think that kind of contingency planning and focus on execution is helpful. I'd say the second thing is if I look at our business, you know, we put a strategy in place, and I feel very good about how the business is performing overall. I mean, I would say the business is firing on all cylinders. Um, and you can look at our fourth quarter performance, uh, to your point, and I think it demonstrates that. And you can look at our guidance, and it demonstrates that. Almost every single product area is performing at or above, most of them above, what consensus was. And that, I think, is another indicator uh, for you. And we have a much more diverse business now. Uh, you know, we have four major growth platforms that are helping us drive that level of growth. Our new product launches are doing extremely well. Obviously, Skyrisi and Rinvoke are, but I'd also say Ubrelvi and Valar are performing, you know, extremely well. And the pipeline, I would say one of the things that gives me the most confidence is when I look at the pipeline behind that that's designed to be able to drive our long-term growth, because one of the things that we focus on is how we're going to make sure that we continue to drive this business to perform at the level it's performing over the long term. And so if I look I look at the Skyrizi and Rinvoke uh, R&D execution around the follow-on indications, it's been nothing less than spectacular, both from a timing standpoint and the kind of data that we have been able to produce. When I look at our HEMOC strategy, we've had a very disciplined strategy there of ensuring that we have enough assets to continue to grow what has become a very large franchise for us. You know, that franchise is $6.6 billion. As we said, we're going to grow at double digits uh, over the long term. What's going to uh, allow us to do that? Well, obviously, Imbruglica is going to continue to drive share. Then Clexta is going to continue to drive share in CLL. But then Clexta has uh, indication expansions into area potential into areas like T1114 and a broader AML population and several other areas. Then I look at Naviticlax. Uh, we uh, should get that product approved and give us an opportunity in myelofibrosis. And then you look at GenMab and you look at uh, our CD47. Those will all allow us to ensure that we can sustain that growth profile over the long term. From neuroscience, same thing. You know, a toe Japan will allow us to expand into the broader migraine population. So I feel very good about uh, what we put in place and our ability to execute against that. So I, th I think there's not one silver bullet that I can point to. I think it's all of those things. Certainly uh, our, our ability in market access has helped a lot in the U.S. Uh, I'd say we're, you know, we're very good at that. But you have to have the right kinds of assets in order to execute that. There, you know, uh, you have to have assets that are differentiated, like Skyrizi and Rinvo. So it's it's the combination of all of that that gives you this performance and gives you the, the long-term sustainable ability to deliver that kind of performance. And I feel awfully good about where we are. So this is Mike. I'll take the Braylar question. Uh, I believe you're talking about the ongoing MDD studies. And what I would say there is that the um, dose selection was based on everything we know about dose response, not only from the prior MDD studies, but across the program, and we've we've done a deep dive into that, and, and we're confident that we're at a dose that ought to have um, optimal effect in, in these indications, in this indication. Uh, with respect to your question about placebo response rate, uh, managing or controlling the placebo response is extremely important in all studies, but particularly in depression studies and other, other studies in, uh, in psychiatry. And I would say that there are many uh, different approaches that are taken that are complementary to each other. The first um, and most important is appropriate site selection. Uh, one has to select sites uh, with an appropriate patient population with experienced investigators um, who are also experienced evaluators in a clinical trial setting, and that's one of the most important things to getting uh, high-quality data to determine whether a drug works. Um, the, the next element has to do with investigator training, investigator manuals, protocol design, and also with respect to inclusion and exclusion criteria to make sure that you have a patient population that is representative of the population 
uh, that you would expect to treat uh, you know, post-registration if the study is successful. And we've taken a look at all of these things. We've taken a look at the blinded aggregate data, and, and we feel good that the measures that we have in place uh, will effectively control uh, the placebo response and, and give us a quality readout. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. Our next question is from Gary Knackman from BMO Capital Markets. Hi, good morning. Um, could you talk about how much more you plan on investing behind the neuroscience franchise to accelerate growth there to get to the long-term targets you talked about, like the $4 billion in Graylar, even without MDD, and how you see the long-term potential in Botox Therapeutic? Um, and then how are you thinking about the launch for a toe Japan later this year, and how will you leverage the work that you've done so far with you, Um How do you think that product will take off in the migraine market? Thank you. Well, I'd say on the, uh, on the neuroscience investment, I mean, we obviously have a very broad neuroscience investment. I mean, we have a significant investment from an R&D standpoint in, uh, in disease-modifying approaches for a number of different neurological diseases that Mike has, has talked about and, and mentioned in his, his comments earlier. So I'd say we have a significant R&D investment. We obviously are investing in Baylor to continue to expand uh, that asset. Uh, again, our goal will be to invest in these areas where you can get maximum uh, capture, market share capture. I think if you look at Baylor and you look at the projections that we've made over time, if you look at the sequential uh, year-over-year dollar growth of that business, that's how you get to the to that number, you know, you can, and, and basically we're going to be able to sustain that. We expect to continue to sustain it. It has relatively low market share, but that's not unusual in, uh, in this market because there's a lot of generic uh, products that uh, psychiatrists cycle patients through and sometimes in combination with patients. So we're going to invest in the business to be able to drive the maximum level of uh, profitable share as we do in any other segment that we're in. Um, same thing on Botox Therapeutics. Obviously, we have R&D programs in there to continue uh, to expand the opportunities uh, in therapeutics. Um, anything you want to add from an investment standpoint, Rob? I think if you look at the overall portfolio, we've, we've detailed out uh, what we expect for Raylar, and that's without the additional indication we think we can get to approaching $4 billion. When you look at the migraine portfolio, you know, peak sales of a, a, than a billion uh, for both Ubrelli and a toe Japan. Uh, we have 951 in the pipeline that we think can be a significant contributor. Obviously, Botox Therapeutic will continue to grow. So uh, we feel pretty good about uh, the portfolio we have and, and that, uh, that double-digit growth outlook uh, is supported by a number of very promising assets. Yeah, and hi, it's Jeff. I'll take the uh, second question on Ato Japan. Uh, I, I think, first, the asset itself is, is very, very attractive. And when you look at the uh, response on the, the migraine-free days at the 10 to the 60 milligram it's really impressive data, uh, very impressive data as this uh, very strong oral. And so we think that we can come at this in a couple different ways. Obviously, you highlighted the leveraging Ubrelvi. You know, we've got a dedicated sales force that calls on uh, the specialty uh, organization, the, neuro, uh, the neurologist, as well as the headache specialist. They'll actually carry both Ubrelvi and Atojapan in, in, the, in, their, in their call plan to really leverage the knowledge of a very uh, established sales force, and as well as focused on the big primary care writers that see a lot of the migraine sufferers. So this is, uh, this is an important dynamic that we'll, uh, we'll be able to leverage when we get into the market uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, also, you know, we're looking at the ability to see how you look on the back end of the, of the migraine journey. So patients are on, uh, you know, Botox therapeutics, for example, which is very substantial. It's the leading in-play share for chronic migraine. But many of those patients don't get full efficacy results. So ultimately, the combination of Botox plus Atojapan as a way to get really migraine freedom in the toughest patients is another area over the long term that we think can, can leverage these assets across the board, whether it's Ubrelvi on the front end with acute a toe Japan in the middle, oral for episodic and chronic, or Botox on the back end. We think it's a nice portfolio that we can commercially manage over time to hit our ambitions that Rob described. 
Thanks, Gary. Operator, next question, Thank please. You. Thank you. And our next question is from Naven Jacob from UBS. Uh, hi, uh, Naveen uh, from UBS. Thanks for taking the question. Um, so first on the uh, ADC, steroid ADC um, for inflammatory conditions, just wanted to get an update there. It's been, uh, I believe you said, delayed for uh, COVID-19. Do you still believe that this uh, approach uh, can lead to success um, in uh, for refractory RA or other inflammatory conditions, just wondering about your uh, confidence in this technology, understanding it's still early in uh, development. Um, and then secondly, uh, as it relates to um, uh, your uh, current uh, state of affairs with Renvoke and SkyRZ, could you remind us of what um, the current in-play market share for uh, Renvoke is in RA and SkyRZ in uh, uh, psoriasis? Thank you so much. Okay, this is Mike. I'll take your first question. Uh, ABBV154, our TNF uh, steroid conjugate, has not been delayed uh, because of COVID. There were uh, some delays in other early immunology programs. Our CD40 and our ROR Gamma T program experienced modest delays, but 154 did not. Um, as we said at, at the time uh, of, of, of the COVID uh, um, peak uh, over the course of last summer, there were a small number of studies that, that we delayed initiation and delayed enrollment. The, the programs that I'm talking about, uh, CD40 and ROR Gamma T, were impacted modestly in that time period, but 154 was not. So that remains on track. Uh, we remain confident in it. Um, we have selected 154 as the agent to go forward. Remember that we had two. Uh, 3373 and 154, and we selected 154 because of advantages it had in linker technology. We're planning to initiate a large phase 2B study in the first half of this year, and then, you know, today we're now saying uh, that we will also be studying uh, phase 2 uh, Crohn's disease uh, as well as polymyalgia rheumatica. Uh, and so that's an important set of indications. It covers a wide range of opportunities. Um, RA and Crohn's disease are areas uh, where we're very active. PMR, polymyalgia rheumatica, is a new area where there's not a lot of therapeutics. Unfortunately, it's a well-established area in medicine, but there's very little uh, in terms of treatment for these patients. Uh, they have considerable pain and suffering from their condition, um, and, it's, and it's particularly steroid responsive. So we think it is a, a, a very attractive target for a steroid ADC approach. So 154 remains on track, and we continue to have confidence in it. Thanks, Mike. It's Jeff. I'll take the in-play share. So if we look at the uh, psoriasis market and, and Skyrizi, we have uh, on our latest data point 33% uh, of in-play share, which is, of course is new patients coming in or newly switched patients. Uh, if you look at the total ABB share, uh, it's approximately 45%, so very remarkable when you add Humira plus Skyrizi in the dermatology space. If you look at the RA space, uh, our latest data points are, you know, between 15 and 16 percent in terms of, of in-play share for Rinvoc and RA, uh, and that's basically neck and neck with Humira, so for a total ABV share of roughly a third of the uh, RA market. And this is Rick. The only thing I'd add on that is when you look at that uh, Skyrizi 33 percent in-play share, it's, it's almost double what the next closest competitor is. I mean, it's it's impressive, the, uh, the gap between uh, Skyrizi and uh, the number two player. And the other thing is, you know, as these brands get more experience in the market, uh, we'll also start to talk about the total TRX share. And I think Skyrizi is at that point now. I think its total TRX share now is 14%, 13.9, 14%, something like that. That's right. Um, and uh, that's pretty impressive for this short period of time. I think it's close to number two uh, in the market in, in TRX share. So they're, they're both doing, you know, very, very well. Thanks, Naveen. Operator, next question, please. And the next question is from Chris Raymond from Piper Sandler. Hey, thanks. Yeah, just a couple questions. Um, you know, first, on the relationship with BI on, on Skyrizi, um, we've had a few inbound questions on the treatment of the royalty um, I know you, you've answered this question a little bit in the past, but also just noticing the big um, non-cash uh, gap charge you took this quarter. 
Um, you, you back out of non-GAAP earnings. So um, I know you have described accounting for this as a business combination, um, but can you maybe give a little bit more color on the rationale and the accounting behind that non-cash charge? And then is there also some threshold number or other event where you'd add this royalty expense back to non-GAAP? And then um, on AbbVie uh, 951, um, we picked up uh, a decent amount of um, – KOL excitement around this asset in Parkinson's. Um, I know phase three is expected later this year, but I wonder if you could maybe talk about the launch, you know, your launch expectations on this and maybe contrast it to the Duodopa experience. Um, j j just from our feedback, it seems like this could expand the addressable PD population pretty sizably. And I don't know, Rick, maybe, you know, frame how this sort of factors into your long range um, $10 billion neuroscience guidance. Thanks. Yeah, Chris, I'll take your question on contingent consideration. So, yes, yeah, so we did account for this as a business combination. So that means, you know, each quarter we do mark-to-mark -mark at the fair value of the future milestone royalty payments. And you did see us take uh, a fair value right up this quarter uh, based on the higher sales outlook as we communicated uh, during the Immunology Day event in December. And then you see in, in the guidance provided today, obviously the outlook uh, for, for SkyRoot continues to increase. And so we're recognizing that liability going forward. Uh, we also take into consideration, because it's a fair value measure, what the market is assuming. So it's not just our own forecast, but it's also uh, what street expectations are. And those have also increased, uh, as we've seen, a very nice ramp. We're starting to see, obviously, the confidence from the street increase, and that's translated into a higher outlook for Sky Rizzi, which then translates into higher future potential royalties. Uh, one of the reasons, you know, I, I wanted to stress also on the free cash flow in my remarks today is because there is some confusion over – you know, that's how we account for it, but it's important to keep in mind that when I talk about free cash flow of $21 billion this year, that accounts for the royalty payments of 2BI. Um, and so uh, you can look at it a few different ways. You can look at it from a – you can you know, track the consideration accretion that we're, that we're recording and the liability on the balance sheet as, as an indicator of the future outlook, but also as we monitor, you know, our, our cash flow pretty carefully – uh, you know, what does that contribute to overall cash flow? So we, we would not be going back. I mean, we, we made the determination of the business combination. We, we don't – we should not anticipate that we would reverse that, uh, but we'll provide, obviously, more clarity on what those royalties look like going forward, given the size of the asset. I mean, I'd also say in that time period when we did BI, it was an absolute requirement on the accounting. Right. For that it, was to be, uh, it wasn't like it was a judgment call or something you desired to do. The accounting said it had to be accounted for in that form, that fashion. It's since been changed going forward, but the window at which we that occurred, uh, that was the, uh, the required accounting treatment. So on number two, uh, Jeff and I will cover number two. Uh, I'll give you sort of a high-level look, and then Jeff maybe can yeah. give you more specificity around it. You know, if you look at Duodopa, uh, I mean, this is a this is a uh, a therapy that has absolutely phenomenal uh, efficacy. You know, you can see these patients who who cannot you know move really, and you you turn on the pump and you start giving them uh, the drug, and you know within a very short period of time they regain their motion. The challenge is it's a very difficult uh, treatment to for the patient to basically. Uh, deal with and the caregiver to deal with on a long-term sustainable basis. You have to do surgery, insert a G-tube, you have to maintain that G-tube open. Um, so that does somewhat limit the population that is uh, able to use it. And so we view this as a way to significantly expand the market. Uh, you know, Jeff's obviously far more familiar with it, so I'll let him uh, give you a little more specific but that's the general concept. I think this could be a significant uh, – one, it could be a significant treatment for these patients who need uh, this kind of uh, therapy, and two, I think it could expand the market pretty significantly. Yeah, I think just to add on that, Rick, it's uh, – we hear the same thing from our KOLs. They're, they're very, very encouraged. And, you know, with the perspective, you look at Duopa or Duodopa, you know, about a half a billion dollar – product with a really difficult uh, challenge on onboarding for these patients, right? You have to do the JPEG surgery. You have challenges with the size of the pump. Uh, nonetheless, it's so remarkable that we do get that level of sale. So if I give you some perspective on the market, if you look at the advanced uh, Parkinson uh, disease market, 90% of it is really old generic orals where the patients just have to take more and more oral medication before they can have any any relief, and then they're still in big trouble. 
So only a minority, about 10%, ever get to, let's say, more advanced device-aided therapy, which is Duopa or Duodopa and uh, deep brain stimulation. So, you know, as we study the market, we agree that as we look at the ability to sort of move from a more convenient way, a simple way for a neurologist to, to get a more advanced therapy without doing a procedure, whether it's brain surgery or the, or the GI surgery, we think we can start to move upstream into that 90% of the really non-workable oral uh, segment. So uh, we, we are encouraged at the, at the recent feedback from our, our KOLs and our study sites and, and are, are anticipating and planning for our, our launch uh, in the coming years. Thanks, Chris. Operator, next question, please. And our next question is from Greg Gilbert from Truist. Yes, I was curious if your Botox cosmetic guidance in the U.S. assumes uh, that Juveau is on the market or off the market this year. And then longer term, um, curious about Botox cosmetic versus therapeutic. Many years ago, Allergan started to explore the idea of separating the two from a reimbursement and pricing standpoint. It, I believe it involved litigation with the government at one point. But um, I don't know if that's still ongoing or if you're still thinking through that possibility since it has implications um, longer term about uh, keeping those assets together or possibly spinning aesthetic someday if conditions warrant. Thank you. Yeah, so I don't know that we're going to specifically comment on what we've assumed as it relates to uh, to Juvo. Uh, I just don't think it's, it's probably appropriate. First of all, it's not that large of a product to begin with, so it wouldn't have a material impact on, on Botox cosmetics. I'd say on the... Um, on, the, uh, on your second question, I, I will tell you emphatically, we have no interest in spinning off the, uh, the aesthetics business. Uh, you know, we have a program in place where we manage the, uh, the differences between the, um, the reimbursement associated with Botox Therapeutics and the, uh, the uh, cash pay portion of the cosmetics business. It's been in place uh, for quite some time. We're quite comfortable with it. We can manage it quite effectively. So. Um, you know, it, it's, it's an important thing that you that you track carefully, but we have a good system in place to be able to do that. Um, uh, but we have no interest in, in spinning off the aesthetics business or, or any aspects of the aesthetics business. Thanks, Greg. Operator, next question, please. Our next question is from Jeff Meacham from Bank of America. Hey guys, it's Aspen. I'm for Jeff. Uh, thanks so much for the questions. Uh, a couple quick ones. So, uh, and within the context of the Zelgems data, um, uh, do you guys have an early view from, from the field as to, to whether docs are differentiating Rinvoc and, and Sky, uh, sorry, Rinvoc and Zelgem safety profiles? And then, uh, quickly on the mid to early stage pipeline, uh, there's obviously a lot going on in your Hemonk space, um, but just getting want to get a sense of how strategically important some more newer disruptive technologies are to add the, such as uh, cell or gene therapy. Thanks. Yeah, I'll take the, uh, the early view from the field. I, I think it's important, at least we've heard from our teams, that some of this data is not really new. Uh, it was, you know, uh, available in the interim analysis that, uh, that, that helped led to the, uh, the label that we have. And so, really, the early reports from our from our field, particularly from the KOLs and the and the big prescribers, is a little bit of a shoulder shrug, like not that uh, not that new news. I would say, from the standpoint of of, of the comparison between Rinvoke and Zelgans, I mean, the if you look at the penetration of the Jack class really across the world, and particularly in the U.S., there's been a significant lift that we just talked about with that in play share. And so, really, what we're what we're hearing from the from the field and from the prescribers are, they view Rinvoke as a differentiated asset in terms of the overall risk benefit, and that's why that share is moving so quickly. And so, that's really what we what we hear in the early days from our from our teams that are uh, connected to those big rheumatologists. So, this is Mike. I'll take the question on the Hemonc portfolio mid stage and newer technologies. What I would say is there is a lot going on in our Hemonc portfolio, obviously, with our late stage molecules in, in the mid stage. Uh, I think you'll see a focus on, on T cell redirection, which is, of course, a newer technology and I think a very attractive approach 
uh, to harness the immune system to control these cancers, and, and you see good progress um, with our CD3 by CD20 and our BCMA uh, T-cell redirecting therapies, and so that is you know, clearly an area of focus for us now, uh, and I think will continue to be uh, in the future. You know, with respect to, to gene therapy, gene therapy is not a single thing. It can be used in different ways. Uh, gene replacement is not an area that we've been focused on. Uh, gene uh, delivery is an enabling technology for other therapeutic approaches like cell-based therapies, and we have early programs in cell-based therapies in HEMONC and in other areas, solid tumor oncology, um, you know, and potentially other areas in the future. Um, and so that's something that we are keeping a close eye on and, and making sure that we have access to the enabling technologies we need to prosecute those targets. I think that for those sorts of approaches, we're probably one generation away from things that are broadly applicable, but we are exploring um, possibilities that we think can, can fulfill that next generation need. Um, and so, you know, we are keeping a, a, a broad eye and are essentially therapeutically agnostic. What I mean by that is we look for the best tool to do the job. We don't find a tool um, and then figure out how to use it. And so in each of these cases, we're going after strong biology. We're going after things that we think will raise the bar on the standard of care. And I think a number of the newer technologies that I mentioned fit that bill. Thanks, Aspen. Operator, we have time for one final question. Thank you. Our final question today is from Louisa Hector from Berenberg. Hello, thank you for taking my question. Um, and, and thank you for the guidance on the cost lines. And I just wondered, given that we have various layers to consider with COVID and then the Allergan inclusion and the synergies, could you comment on the implied cost ratios for 2021? and how representative these are of the combined entity? Um, and is there anything else we should be thinking about for those cost lines as we look out to 22? COVID-related savings um, may be sticky, maybe ones that may reverse. Uh, and could you tell us the level of synergies that you achieved already in 2020? Thank you. Hi, Louisa, this is Rob. So I think now that we have you know, our first full year with the combined company and you're looking at these profiles, I think you could assume they're indicative of, uh, you know, in the range of what you'd expect going forward. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that, that this is probably a cleaner guide than, say, when you have a partial year like we had in 2020. Uh, as it re relates to the synergies we achieved in 2020, uh, we achieved about $600 million of synergies, about $400 million that was in R&D and $200 million in SG&A. And you see we've now increased that to $1.7 billion in 2021, with about a little bit roughly half of that coming from R&D, about in the 40% range S SG&A and about 10% coming from cost of goods. Thanks, Louisa. And that concludes today's conference call. If you'd like to listen to a replay of the call, please visit our website at investors.abv.com. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference. You may disconnect at this